Hi everyone, in this video, you're gonna learn about something known as event bubbling and capturing. So if you're, no, if you're familiar with the words bubbling and capturing and you know what they are all about, well, you're gonna be bored for the next few minutes, so you should probably find something entertaining to do while, while I'm currently talking. But it is all new to you, this is all new and very foreign, you've never heard of what they do in the context of JavaScript, well, stick around. What you're gonna learn about event bubbling and capturing will really give you a whole new perspective on how events work in your applications. So let's get started. So to help explain all of this, I'm gonna start with a simple example. So here I have uh, the simple example. You have three buttons labeled one, two, and three. What I'm gonna do is click on the button labeled one. And when I click on it, a little dialog appears saying button clicked. Behind the scenes, there's nothing crazy going on. All I have is just some code that listens for a click event on the, on the button labeled one. And when the click event is overheard, it calls some code that displays an alert with the text button clicked. Let's look into that in a little bit more detail. I'm gonna go back to the slides on that one. The markup for what you see here is pretty straightforward. You have some elements, you have some divs, you have some siblings, some parents. It's your typical happy DOM element family. If you're not a huge fan of looking at your markup in, in this format, you can visualize it in this format instead. It's the exact same representation of the markup you saw earlier, but in this case, you can have, you can have a much better view of the parent, child, and sibling relationships. And the button we care about is button one, and it's located at the, at the very bottom left of, our, of this particular DOM representation. So now, the code that caused the alert to appear is your standard add event listener, add you know, event handling logic. I'm trying to get access to the button one element. Once I gain access to it, I call add event listener on it. And there are three arguments add event listener takes. The first one is the event I care about, which is click. The second argument is the event handler that gets called when the click event is overheard. And a third argument, which is often a true or false, and you know most of us ignore it, is the is the star of this particular video, which you will learn about in a little bit, a little bit more. So the thing about clicking on an element and having some code appear, having some code execute, is that if you're starting out with events and aren't fully aware of how events work, I was definitely in this camp when I was learning how to use JavaScript, is that by clicking on button one, the, the, the mistake is that it's very easy to think that the event is gonna be fired from the element I'm clicking on as well. In this case, the click event is gonna be fired from button one. So as you'll find out very, very soon, if you didn't know this already, events don't start at the thing you trigger the event on. When in languages like JavaScript and in languages very much unlike JavaScript, when you initiate an event, when you fire an event, events always start at the root. It doesn't matter, I clicked on button one all the way at the bottom, your event's gonna start its destiny, you know, start its journey at the window element and slowly make its way all the way down until it hits its destination, which is the element you actually clicked on. Now, your event going all the way down isn't a very transparent and quiet event. It essentially touches every single HTML element on the path to its destination, and on its path, it informs every element that a click event is actually taking place. So every element is well informed in a very noisy fashion that a click event is currently happening. And if that annoyance isn't enough for your, for your DOM, an event, once it hits the destination, also makes its way all the way back up. It retraces its steps and notifies every element on its path back to where it started from about the event that it is currently, currently representing. So every element on the tree gets notified of a click event one more, one more time. So your events going down, your events going up, it, it's not very technical. It's not the way you would probably describe it to someone of, of authority. The, there are names for this. So your event making its way down to its destination, it's known as the capturing phase, often known as phase one. And your event making its way back to its origin, making its back, way back to the root once it has hit its destination, that's known as the event bubbling phase, also known as phase two. So when we talk about event capturing and event bubbling, what we're really referring to is the phase at which the event is actually alive in. And the way you specify or you even 
have any notion of caring about the phase is part of, is it's when you're defining the arguments for your adamant listener function. Like I mentioned earlier, the three arguments it takes, the first one being the event you care about, the second one being the event handler code that gets executed when the event is called, and the last one being a, a Boolean value of true or false that specifies whether this event will be listened to in the capture phase, which is specified by true, or in the bubble phase, which is captured, captured by false. Now, why is this important? Well, this is not very important if you're dealing with listening for the event on the element you're actually triggering the event on. But it is more important when you're dealing with intermediate elements on the path to your destination. So for example, let's say I am listening for a click event on button one, and I'm listening for it in the capture phase. On button one, nothing it doesn't matter. A click event will be overheard when your event makes its way to the bottom. Now, let's say I'm listening for the click event on either body 1a, 2, or 3a, and I'm listening for it in the capture phase. What happens is when I click on button one, my event is making its way down the tree. And as my event's making its way down the tree, every element will basically get a chance to check if there's an event listener that is going to be called when the event is making its way down the capture phase. So in this case, if I do have, let's say, an event handler that is listening for the click event on, let's say, the 1a element in the capture phase, the event handler will get called as my event is making its way back down. And notice that the event handler gets called well before I'm actually reaching the button one event handler. So that's actually a, you know, an interesting way for you to you know, indirectly manipulate what your DOM elements do when another element has actually been the one that triggered a particular event. So that is very important because one of the things you'll realize is that with events, you can also interrupt them. You can very rudely, to be specific, interrupt them as they're making their journey either up or down, down the tree. So let's take an example. The way you do that is by using the stop propagation method. And the way this method works is you call it on the event, usually within the event handler of a particular event that you're just overhearing. And when this method gets called, your event is pretty much stopped, you know, in its tracks, isn't allowed to continue forward in either phase that it's currently in. So let's look at an example of this. So let's say that, you know, let's go back to the 3A element that we were talking about earlier. And you're looking for the click event on it. And it's in the capture phase, you have the true. And when the click event is overheard on in the capture phase, you basically call the stop propagation method on this. And what this happens is, like I mentioned earlier, let's say I'm clicking on button one, and my click event is happily making its way down a tree. When it detects a click event at the 3A element, which it will based on the code that I have here, the stop propagation method, which is that a do something event handler, will get called, and your event will basically be stopped. And when an event stops, it is stopped permanently for that particular, particular instance of it running. There's no you know, parallel equivalent of it starting from the bubbling phase and making its way back up. Your event is done, that's it. You have to either, either remove this code or click on some other element, like let's say the 1A or something above the stop propagation call so that your event will basically run to, run to completion. And this is actually very useful in a whole host of scenarios where you are working with UI elements and you're doing more complex interactions, like I said, drag and drops or dealing with controls or even in some examples that I have like parallax scrolling, where I don't want the event to fully make its way up and down the tree. I want to stop before it causes you know, some form of damage that I don't really, really care about. So between event bubbling, event capturing, and being able to interrupt events with the stop propagation method, you have a lot of control over how events can be made to work. And if this is all new to you, you know, you might not use it, all the stuff you learn immediately, but you will find that at some point in your future, this trivial knowledge right now will actually become practical knowledge that will save you a whole lot of time, either in implementation or in debugging things. So if you want to learn more, just go to croup.com search for events, and you will find the text-based version of this tutorial. Probably type, will title something like Event Bubbling and Capturing. If you need help, either comment anywhere on the forums, comment in the tutorial, comment on YouTube, wherever. Just find a way to get in contact with me. I also spend a lot of time on Twitter, on Facebook, and on YouTube, so, you know, find a way to reach out to me. 
And if you found the tutorial, this video, interesting, entertaining, informative, or any of the above, you'll definitely love my book, JS101, JavaScript for Beginners. It's available on Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle editions. So definitely check it out. They make great gifts for your friends, your family, loved ones, and enemies. So definitely never miss out on